Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode we're going to discuss similarities in mice and men, so let's jump right in. <laughs> Together, primates and colugos form the clade Primatomorpha, and regardless of where tree shrews sit, Glyra is the next closest clade which is well supported. We meet the Glyers 75 million years ago in the Campanian Epoch of the Late Cretaceous. The world isn't extremely different from the last tale. Almost every mammal at this time is small and shrew-like, and non-avian dinosaurs are the dominant terrestrial animals. In the past, some researchers have hypothesized that dinosaurs were already decreasing in diversity before the KPG extinction event, and the meteor was just the straw that broke the uh, sauropods back. However, this has been challenged in recent years, as in the Campanian Epoch, just a few million years before the meteor hit, dinosaurs were still undergoing adaptive radiations. For much of the late Cretaceous in North America, a sea called the Western Interior Seaway split the continent in half. To the east was the continent Appalachia, including the eroded remains of what was once a giant mountain range, and to the west was the continent Laramidia. It is in this seaway that paleontologists have found various mosasaurs, plesiosaurs, giant sea turtles, large predatory fish, and pterosaurs. Most of these belong to the Neobrera chalk formation. During the Campanian though, this seaway started closing due to the subduction of the oceanic Farallon plate under the continental North American plate, causing crustal thickening and deformation. The Farallon plate moved from a lower to a more shallow position under the North American plate, causing tectonic stress to be moved further inland. This resulted in the uplift of central North America, connecting Laramidia and Appalachia. The uplift of land, especially into mountains, due to compression at convergent tectonic plate boundaries is called orogeny, and intriguingly, Orogenic events have been repeatedly documented to correlate with adaptive radiations. Relevant to the Campanian, both Sorolophene hadrosaurids and Chasmosaurine ceratopsids radiated following the orogenic event produced by the Farallon plate being subducted under the North American plate. Hadrosauridae split into Lambiosaurinae and Sorolophinae at the end of the Santonian Epoch around 83 million years ago. Lambiosaurines are found in Europe, Asia, and North America, but Sorolophines originated in Western North America. During the Campanian North American orogeny, Sorolophines underwent a major diversification, resulting in Acrostavus, Myasaura, Brachylophosaurus, Procerolophus, Griposaurus, and Critosaurus. As for ceratopsids, both Centrosaurinae and Chasmosaurinae originated in the Campanian of North America, and the radiation of Campanian Chasmosaurines includes Chasmosaurus, Mohoceratops, Aguyaceratops, Utahceratops, Pentaceratops, Coahuilaceratops, Cosmoceratops, Vegaceratops, Anchiceratops, and Orhinoceratops. Now we turn to the mammals. Glyra splits into two branches, Lagomorpha and Rodentia. Lagomorpha contains the rabbits, hares, and pikas, whom we discussed in Rabbit Evolution. See that video for more info. So we go to the rodents. 40% of all mammal species are rodents, and 13%, over 25% of rodent species, are just the family Muridae, the mice, rats, and gerbils. One of the easiest ways to identify a rodent is by looking at their teeth. Rodents only have incisors and molars, no canines or premolars. The incisors also grow continuously, which is a condition called hypselodonty. Their incisors are separated by a gap, or diastema, from the molars. At least one rodent, the shrew rat Posidentomys vermidax, has lost even its molars, which aren't needed for its specialized diet that only includes earthworms. Posidentomys is a member of the so-called Echiothrix clade, all members of which are omnivores, endemic to the island Sulawesi. We've met a couple clades of island endemic rodents before, the Nisomyonae of Madagascar and the Caviomorpha of South America. There are five recognized suborders of rodents. Anomaloromorpha, the spring hares and scaly-tailed flying squirrels, Castoromorpha, the beavers, pocket gophers, kangaroo, rats, and mice, 
Histricomorpha, the old world porcupines, mole rats, and caviomorphs. Myomorpha, the true mice, true rats, voles, hamsters, lemmings, and gerbils. And Syuromorpha, the squirrels, chipmunks, and mountain beavers. Together, this order has invaded essentially every type of terrestrial biome, from the desert, to the tundra, to the rainforest, to the grasslands, and some are even semi-aquatic, like beavers, water voles, and capybaras. We'll meet the beavers in better detail in the next tale. While we think of most rodents as small, some have reached massive sizes. Phoberomys, which lived from about 9 to 7 million years ago in South America, appears to have been about 3 meters, or 9.8 feet long, and weighed 150 to 250 kilograms, or 330 to 550 pounds. And Josepho artigasia, from 3 to 2 million years ago in South America, was 2.6 meters, or 8.6 feet long, and weighed 480 to 500 kilograms, or 1,060 to 1,100 pounds. These were rodents that you could have ridden like horses, well, only if they'd let you. In today's tale, we are meeting the house mouse, Mus musculus, one of the most well-studied model organisms in biology. In 2002, the Mouse Genome Sequencing Consortium published the first high-quality draft sequence of the mouse's genome. The revelations from that enterprise constitute the mouse's tail. One thing you're probably wondering is, well, how many genes does the mouse have? Interestingly, the mouse seems to have about the same number of genes as us humans. I say as I am definitely human too. Both humans and mice have between 21,000 and 25,000 protein coding genes, but the mouse genome is slightly smaller than ours, being 2.5 billion base pairs long haploid compared to our 3.2 billion base pairs. That might seem odd at first. We consider ourselves to be far more complex than mice, but our genome isn't that much larger than theirs, and we don't have substantially more genes than they do. Side note, the disconnect between genome size and gene count is called the C-value paradox, and we'll return to that much later in the humped bladderwort's tale. Further, humans and mice share about 99% of their genes. Only 1% of the mouse's genes are rodent-specific. That is in part why mice are such good model animals for humans. They are susceptible to many of the same diseases as us. Diabetes, atherosclerosis, heart disease, cancer, glaucoma, anemia, hypertension, obesity, osteoporosis, bleeding disorders, asthma, and various neurological disorders. Mice are also easy to handle and have a high rate of reproduction, both of which contribute to their model organism status. So if mice have about the same number of genes as us, almost all the same genes as us, and a genome that is only slightly smaller than ours, how are mice and men so different? The primary difference between our species is the expansion of certain gene families. In other words, the duplications of closely related genes. Clearly, the acquisition of obligate bipedality, a large brain, and the ability to do math and philosophy didn't require gaining huge numbers of genes. Keep this tale in mind next time someone tries to tell you that the evolution of new features necessarily requires evolving large numbers of new genes. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.